Well, hello, everyone. Um, man, that was really awesome. We need to get you to come to Lincoln, Nebraska next. <laughs> um, so Mary and I actually are, are collaborators on this project called the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project. So we're going to sort of do a song and dance. We'll be up and down and up and down a couple times uh, talking about this. And what it is, is it's a project to try to capture and witness a watershed in motion. And our goal is to build community around a watershed, which is very similar to what you guys are talking about, about building community. So um, first off, I guess I want to see if there's anybody out there uh, that's from Nebraska. Raise your hand. One. <laughs> <laughs> Two. Good. OK. How many? Um, have flown over it at 30,000 feet or drove, <laughs> driven through it at 80 miles an hour. That's great. How many have, is it's at their next uh, destination vacation? And, no? <laughs> okay, well, good. Good. All right, well, that's way to go. So let me show you a little bit of, a little bit of Nebraska that, um, that we've captured in the last year. These are sand hill cranes. And in Nebraska, Nebraska and the Platte River is the pinch in the hourglass of the central flyway. It's the largest gathering of cranes anywhere in the world. It's a half a million birds in about three to four weeks in the spring. on the left, otter on the right. You can tell who's boss. <laughs> Bighorn sheep. You see the one up top? These are prairie chickens. It's on their uh, mating grounds called Lex up in the Nebraska sand hills. So I show you those because all of those creatures that you just saw there are intimately tied to water and they're intimately tied to the Platte River and the Platte Basin. Um, there is a quote by Lauren Isley, a great essayist, if there is magic on this planet, it is contained in water. I saw that firsthand many years ago. I was driving from my home in Lincoln, Nebraska, out to Audubon's Row Sanctuary on the Central Platte. I got there, it was in September, and my buddy Bill, who is the director there, said, Mike, he said, I think the water's coming back. If you want to go walk up the dry riverbed, you might find it. And I said, what do you mean the water's coming back? And he said, well, it's basically been diverted for irrigation all summer, and now irrigation season is over. And when I was driving over the county road bridge five miles upstream coming into, the, into work this morning, he said, I saw the water coming underneath the bridge. He said, if you go walk out onto the bed and go around the corner, you'll probably see it coming. And so I had a little bit of time that evening, and I did. And I sort of, you know, started walking into the sunset, and I came around this corner, and, and there it was. And it was this tongue of water that 
it, the, the water came, actually it, it bubbled to the surface from underground first, like somebody had a hose underneath the sand. And then that tongue of water that was a distance away moved to that bubbling up of water, and then they joined together, and then they moved downstream, and they just sort of kept pulsing like that. And if you looked really closely on the edge of the lip of that water, you could see all these tiny little fish, as if like they were pushing that, that, you know, that, that tongue forward. And the birds were coming out, and the deer were coming to the river. It was like this, you know, the angels were singing. It was like this Disney moment, you know, but that was the power of that water. And it really, I guess, started gotten me thinking about this place that's been my home most of my life, about this river and what its story is and how can we elevate that story. So this is the exact same place, except it's from about 1,000 feet up, looking to the west. And the Platte River is a, it was once a great braided prairie river. Now it's one of the most over-appropriated rivers and stressed watersheds in the continent and probably the world. So it's in working landscape and it works really hard for us in a lot of ways. And I think the first thing that we have to do to try to figure out how we can take care of rivers in a lot of cases is to ask this basic question, of where does our water come from? So as I talk about the Platte River, and Mary and I talk about the Platte a little bit today, I want you to think about this question from your reference point about where you are where does your water come from in your watershed? And asking that question for us, particularly in the Western United States, from the Great Plains to the rain shadow of the Sierras, is really important because we measure rainfall in the hundredths of an inch, right? You know? So back in, if you remember, a guy named John Wesley Powell, you know, smart man, well, well ahead of his time, Civil War hero, um, in 18, and he, and he first guy to, to lead an expedition down the Colorado River all the way, all the way to the sea. And, and in 1890, he proposed to Congress, he said, instead of drawing a bunch of straight square lines on a map in the West to delineate states, let's do it by watershed lines. You know, much smarter idea, right? Because then we have all of our interests within that state sort of together. Well. It had a little bit of traction, but there was too much momentum, too much political power at that point. And in fact, the land was just worth too much that it got shoved aside. And Powell went on to, to have a you know, really good career at the USGS and other places, but um, I wish they would have listened. <laughs> so so here is, you know, nature knows no straight lines, right? These, fingers, these veins of, of, of rivers and streams. This is where Mary and I are from. And here's the delineation of the, of the smaller watersheds or sub-basins. And then here's the straight lines that we drew on the map back in the late 1860s to delineate states. And here is our Platte Basin, 90,000 square miles in the heart of the Great Plains in North America. So where does our water come from? Well, it comes from three places. It comes from snowpack in the Colorado and Wyoming Rockies, a big bank account up there of snow. It comes from the Ogallala Aquifer, 174,000 square mile, you know, sponge of water that underlies seven states. Nebraska sits on half of it in the Nebraska sand hills, half the volume. And then our weather and climate, you know, and in the Great Plains, it's always too hot or too cold or too wet or too dry and oftentimes all on the same day. You know, it's a, it's a really um, crazy place to live. So here's the Platte River at Rose Sanctuary in 2011, in the middle of summer. It was one of the biggest water years in record in our, in our basin. Here it was in 2012 at exactly the same time. Somebody shut the water off in 2012 and we went through what was called a flash drought of about 18 months until late September in 2013 when it started to rain in the upper reaches of the watershed and didn't stop for 24 hours and dumped about 24 inches of rain that pushed all the way through the system. So wouldn't that have been cool though to see the change between 11 and 12? Well, now we can and we're using time-lapse cameras to do it. So what you're gonna watch here is the Platte River from that same vantage point over about a two-year period 
from early 2013 through 2014. And I guess what I want you to just watch is, is you know, we're trying to take that old, boring physical geography textbook and try to bring it to life and actually use the power of photography to show you that a watershed and anything on the skin of the land is a living, breathing organism. It moves and flows. The change of the seasons with drought and flood as water is taken away and put back. It's this, it's this you know, beautiful thing that um, you know, has a right to exist just like any of the rest of us do, I think, personally. So in 2011, my buddy Mike Farrell, who's been a filmmaker for public television for 45 years, and I, we decided to start a project called the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project to try to see this watershed in motion. And what we've done is we have deployed roughly 50 time lapse cameras throughout the entire basin. Each one's a different chapter in the story of that water. And each camera is taking pictures every hour of daylight, every day, 365 days a year for several years. We have about 1.6 million images now in our, in our image archive. Our highest one is at a place called Lake Agnes at about 11,500 feet in northern Colorado. The lowest one is at the drain where the Platte dumps into the Missouri River near Plattsmouth, Nebraska. And this is what the inside of the camera looks like. We're using high-end Nikon DSLR cameras and we're using Raspberry Pi computers, which are taking over the brains of the camera and telling the camera what to do. We use capacitors for battery power. And we're able to communicate. If we have cellular service anywhere, we can communicate with those cameras remotely. And they send us pictures every time that they take a picture up to the cloud and back down to servers at the University of Nebraska. And for those that don't have cellular service, we use a spot satellite tracking device that sends us an email, basically, to say, hey, we just took a picture. We don't see pictures. We don't get an email. We know something's wrong. We've got to go out and look at that camera. So here's just sort of a little uh, portfolio of sorts of some of the different camera views in our watershed. This is near Boulder, Colorado. This is up in the high country, the Rockies. This is at Seminole Reservoir. This is at Lake McConaughey, one of the largest earthen dams in North America, in Nebraska. We have cameras on center pivots. We have them on windmill stock tanks in the sand hills. We have them, yes, we do actually have waterfalls in Nebraska. <laughs> it's not 100 feet tall, but it's about 20 feet tall, and it's pretty amazing. Um, that's a, a big island out there in the Platte. Those are all cranes at night on the roost in the spring. So let's look at one of these cameras a little more in depth. This is one called Mixed Slide in the Nebraska Sandhills, and it's been working hard for about five years. This is all the pictures from year 2013, you know, one picture a day, 365 days roughly. So what can you do with that big library of images? So one thing is, is we can just simply show them one at a time, like showing the change of the season. So here's, here it is in early spring, here it is in, in later summer, in fall, winter time. But where it really starts to sing is when you can put it together in a time-lapse video and really watch this land change and breathe. Another thing you can do is you can take those images. This is a tiled image of that exact same location, but each one of those, there's 12 bars here, and each one is taken from each month of the year. So it's a more artistic representation, which we've used in, in exhibitions, in art exhibitions uh, in Nebraska and, and in other places now. Another thing that we can do is we can tile these time-lapse cameras together and put them all in motion at one time so that you can see you know, 16 views of the watershed from the very highest up in the upper left to the very lowest down in the lower right and see this thing in motion. And again, this has been used, these this sorts of uh, presentation has been used in art exhibitions. 
Another thing we're doing with these cameras now is we're starting to put graphics on top of them. So this is the confluence of the Platte and the Missouri, and this is how much the river moved between May 2015 and July 2015. And over the course of the six years this camera's been in, in place, it's moved back and forth and back and forth and back and forth probably a dozen times. We're also looking at smaller stages now besides the big landscapes, and we're putting out cameras of all sorts of types. We're using um, surveillance cameras, we're using GoPros that are, that are remoted, we're using camera traps, all to look at these little stages out there to also see and monitor change over time in a watershed and to prove that every square foot of nature is still being used. So, you know, as a professional photographer, one of the tools in our tool bag is to use camera traps where we're out there trying to look for one specific image that we want to take home from that location. So we're looking at a beaver dam right here and beaver going over the dam. But if you leave those cameras in place for a long time, you're going to capture lots of creatures and they actually sort of serve as time-lapse cameras in a way where you can see all the citizens that are, that are using this one little patch of dam over the course of the season. So you're seeing ducks and mink and otters and, and raccoons and everything else. We're putting out video camera traps now that are staying in place again for long periods of time and capturing things that we never ever in our wildest dreams would have been able to capture if we were just there waiting. These are otters. The cool thing about this one is that it's an above water and a below water camera trap. So watch what happens here. Just caught a huge catfish. We have reams and reams and reams of this sort of stuff. It's not all that great, <laughs> but, you know. So, for example, you know, let's just tile it and put it together and let's see. It. This is another art installation. Everything that you're seeing here is all within about maybe a hundred yards of each other. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna pass it over to my friend and colleague, Mary, to take you a little further into this. Good afternoon. I came to the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project as a riparian ecosystem ecologist, and when I saw the, the database of images, I first saw this as a, a source of long-term data that could be analyzed and used for research purposes. And I also saw these images as a way to further our reach for communication about natural history and scientific research. And I work at a primarily um, undergraduate research institution where all of our students complete independent projects that emphasize experiential learning. And I also saw this project is a way to connect students who are going to be our next generation of communicators and storytellers to these technologies to learn the techniques and to, to help us share outcomes. So this is a photograph of senior Simon Tai at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, and he's been working with Mike and me and others on this project for the last two years. And one of his projects is focused on looking at the long-term changes of a beaver lodge that Mike has instrumented with cameras that are shown in this image. So Simon looked at about um, nine or 10 months of images that spanned four seasons on this lodge. And one of the objectives of the study was just to see how dynamic the structure was on the floodplain. And we know that beavers are very important as keystone species, but to really highlight how the beaver structure is a hub of activity for other wildlife. So this time lapse shows the beaver lodge deflating over 120 days. And this image shows examples of the diversity of other animals that were observed on the lodge. In all, Simon saw more than 30 species of it from the images, and he looked at about 35,000 images, with birds being the most diverse group. 
And these animals utilize the lodge exterior at different times of the day and at different times of the year. And one of the components that Simon contributed to this project was to explore different ways of visualizing this outcome. He showed it in traditional graphical ways, but he also created visualizations such as these. So the circle represents a clock with midnight being at the top and midday being at the bottom and the shaded area showing generally nighttime. And he looked at uh, the activity patterns around this clock. So for example, beavers tended to be active uh, in the nighttime. And this top image is just here for fun to show. One of the images showed a beaver that was actually carrying a large chunk of ice onto the lodge. So over the period of study, we saw all kinds of material being delivered, but this is one of the most unusual. Uh, there were other, a number of other species of mammals, including mink, muskrat, otter, and raccoons, and they also tended to be nocturnal and were present on the lodge throughout the study. And birds, uh, more than 24 species were observed. Uh, they tended to be there around dawn and dusk and arrived in the spring. There were also uh, painted turtles that basked on the edge of the lodge and some of the non-native bullfrogs. So collectively, this study enabled an undergraduate to be involved with these kinds of technologies and showed how the lodge is a dynamic hub of, of activity, day and night, within this very agriculturally dominated landscape. And more broadly, the, this project and ones like it are providing opportunities for students and early career professionals to collaborate with a diverse team and to share outcomes in new ways. So increasingly, our camera locations are becoming hubs for other kinds of data collection. And where the camera, the pictures show kind of the background information, and then we can layer other kinds of information. So pictured here in the center is one of our colleagues, Emma Brindley Buckley. And a lot of the material I'm going to show in the next few slides derives from her work. Emma recently completed a master's at UNL, at University of Nebraska at Lincoln, in conjunction with the project. And she now works as a researcher in science communication communicator on the team. So one of the things that Emma has done is led efforts to derive uh, information from the images themselves. And what this panel shows are water level inundations from a wet meadow in south central Nebraska, which is adjacent to the river. And she is able to extract the amount of area that's, or show the amount of area that's wet over time. And so in this series from just a few weeks, you can see an expansion of contraction of the water in that wet meadow. Uh, because these time-lapse images are collected hourly, we can use them to ger generate continuous data that can be used to link to other uh, variables, like activity levels of birds and amphibians that utilize these habitats. This plot shows the month, um, a month of falling and rising water levels on one month during the spring. And this project is a long-term data set because the cameras have been going now since 2011. We can use them to look at changes over multi-year intervals. And so Mike mentioned earlier this drought period that we're recovering from. And this shows seven years, or nearly seven years of wet meadow and how wet that meadow is shown in the blue um, and the recovery of the drought. And all of this matters because uh, this is a, a riparian ecosystem that is very heavily impacted and altered by human activities. And it's also a critical corridor both east and west and north and south for a variety of migratory and resident species. Probably most famous, the hundreds of thousands of sandhill cranes that traverse the central flyway and the endangered hooping crane, for which this is critical habitat, but also for a number of smaller uh, species like aquatic invertebrates and amphibians and reptiles. So being able to understand how these systems expand and contract, contract hydrologically and how those ecotones be between aquatic and terrestrial ecosystems change is really important to our understanding of the, of the function of these systems and also to be able to show this to people who may not have the opportunity to physically go out and walk across these wet meadows. So one of the most exciting new areas is a collaboration we have with Purdue University's Center for Global Soundscapes. And so we're starting to couple acoustic recorders with these time-lapse cameras. And we view the cameras sort of as setting the stage for our work, and then the sound recordings as giving us information about the players in this landscape. So I'm going to play a compilation that shows uh, several months of change on this wet meadow on the Central Platte River, coupled with sound recordings.
So the power of sound. Um, just to quickly um, talk about the total solar eclipse that we had on August 21st. Um, so I look at these cameras as long-term data sets, but they also give us uh, a chance to look at things opportunistically. So this eclipse happened uh, between about 11.30 and 2.30 Central Standard Time. And these are photographs that Emma collected during that event. We were able to work with our technical partners to change the settings on some of the time-lapse cameras to collect time-lapse images more frequently and also to couple other sensors um, on the landscape. And so these images show two locations on the plot um, and how the light levels changed during the eclipse. Um, of note, it didn't get completely dark, more like twilight during the peak of, of the eclipse. And we did not detect in the images that we've gone through any visible biological changes in the images. We had some cameras on a bat roost and some on flowers and, and other features of the landscape. But we did see changes in the frequency and amplitude of some of the sound recordings. And so we're in the process of analyzing that now. We're also in the early stages of coupling other sensors like temperature loggers and um, humidity sensors with the cameras so that we can upload data simultaneously. And this was a test run for some of that. And we were able to look and see uh, the change in declining temperatures shown in the blue and increasing humidity during the eclipse. So this is uh, an ongoing analysis, but I just wanted to show this as an example of ways that we can couple all these technologies to uh, look at things opportunistically. So we're talking a lot here about connections across watersheds. So on the plat, we're part of the sub uh, of the Missouri River Basin. And I just want to close with a, a few thoughts about another watershed that means a lot to me personally. Uh, I was a graduate student in the Freshwater Sciences Interdisciplinary Doctoral Program at the University of New Mexico that was led by Dr. Cliff Dom there and, and Dr. Amy Ward at the University of Alabama. And some of you may know Cliff Dom from this area. Uh, he recently finished a term as a lead, science for the Delta, lead scientist for the Delta Science Project. Um, but in my first semester at the University of New Mexico, he took several of us to the Gila River, which is a a very wild and dynamic river in the uh, upper reaches of the Colorado River system. And he wanted us to see this river because it's a system, a gravel bed system with a very intact riparian community, a very diverse assemblage of species and cottonwood trees in various successional stages. And it serves as a reference system for a lot of systems that are heavy, heavily regulated. And in the years since, the Gila has become um, a stage for a lot of debate about water, water issues um, that are very similar themes that are playing out in other watersheds. And there are currently a lot of discussions happening on the Gila about diverting um, surface water flows. And so even though this is a reference system that still contains a natural flow regime, and we put so much focus on restoring rivers, there's still places like the Gila that um, could have their flow regime altered in the upcoming years. So one of the current projects that I've been working on uh, with a colleague at the University of Nebraska was a short documentary film about how people are connected to this landscape and um, their views and visions for the future. And we intended to just document the diversity of people and perspectives on this river. And that film will show uh, this week, uh, Friday night in Santa Fe, New Mexico at the Santa Fe Independent Film Festival. We're also increasingly taking students that uh, are being trained in the Platte Basin time-lapse project and with the, the time-lapse approach to dig and digital storytelling approach and working on the Gila. And I'll just close with a short animation that we made last week showing the dynamic river channels of the Gila over a 40-year time period. So I will turn it over to Mike to conclude, but thank you. So the Platte Basin Time Lapse Project, um, we have about 30 uh, cooperating organizations, about six major funders, um, and 
living in Nebraska, you know, we're 97% privately owned, and mo most of the Great Plains is like that. So it's a very different dynamic than it is in a lot of Western states with a lot more public land. So we have to work together. Um, we have to come to the table together, agree to disagree on lots of things, but we all have to move forward. And we're always moving forward with the idea of keeping water in mind. And, and one of the things that we've done in this project is, one of the outshoots of it is, is our time-lapse uh, project website. So this is it, and this is where a lot of uh, storytelling happens. It's where we have educational modules that we work with school teachers to build curriculum for kids in public schools uh, throughout the state around water. Um, and we also have some of our research that is there on that site. And we also have the entire bank of images that are there uh, with a gallery from all of these cameras and the things that they've seen over time. And, and I say we a lot because it is we. It maybe started with two uh, guys in uh, 2011, but it's, it's not Mike and I's project anymore at all. It's, it's all of these people here, including Mary and others, uh, and, and many more, and, and, and a lot of students, a lot of undergraduate students and graduate students and then former students that we've actually hired to come on to be part of this project and help us do what we do. So um, it really is trying to build community and we're now reaching out into academic institutions in Colorado and Wyoming and other places like that. So um, it's, when we started, I had no idea that this is where it would end up, but uh, feels good and I think, we're, I think we're doing good work. So I wanna finish um, with this quote and then a little, a little uh, about two and a half minute uh, time lapse uh, movie of the Platte Basin that was put together by our student interns and by Mariah Lundgren who graduated from the university and now works for us full time. So the quote, this grand show is eternal. It is always sunrise somewhere. The dew is never dried all at once. A shower is forever falling. A vapor is ever rising. Eternal sunrise, eternal sunset, eternal dawn and gloaming on sea and continents and islands each in its turn as the round earth rolls. John Muir. So here we go.
the little snowflake that lands in the mountain. And as time goes on and that little snowflake begins to melt and runs down the stream into the river through the power plants and winds up to somebody's head gate. And either through a pivot or through a tube, that little snowflake will say to a plant, here am I, use me, I'll help you grow. That's my take of a snowflake. <laughs> Bob didn't talk to us all day until the very end on his, on his beet farm in western Nebraska. And he had been pondering that all day, and he said, wait, I got something to say. <laughs> Thank you very much, folks.